A military strategist, Sun Tzu, has said, know yourself and know your enemy, and you can fight a hundred battles without disappointment. As a military, we spend a lot of time thinking about the resources and strategies that we have available to us to fight weapons of mass destruction. But it's important that we take pause and take one step back and we look at the leaders and the leadership that spend time developing re weapons of mass destruction and then they, de they develop strategies to employ those weapons. The reason is if we can understand what would motivate people to develop weapons of mass destruction and how in fact they might employ those or what might motivate them to use those once they have them, it, would, it will help us to hopefully provide incentives up front for them not to produce them or if they do produce them to, to understand their psyche so that it will help us in our deterrence role uh, as with the weapons of mass destruction. That's what the U.S. Air Force Cattle Proliferation Center is involved with right now, is an adversary's project to try, to try and develop a, a uh, small group of expertise on leaders around the world uh, that we're concerned about that, ha that potentially might use weapons of mass destruction. Today, we have one of those experts with us uh, who will be speaking to us about two different areas. One, Saddam Hussein one of the greatest pet perpetuators of weapons of mass destruction in the last two decades, developed a huge arsenal. And then talking about terrorism and the leadership roles and, and how different terrorist organizations might work and, and, and potentially use weapons of mass destruction. Well, Dr. Gerald Post is a professor of psychiatry and political psychology and a professor of international relations at George Washington University. He also heads up the political psychology program there at uh, George Washington uh, University. He got his bachelor's and his medical degree at Yale, and then he did postgraduate work in psychiatry at Harvard and the National Institute of Mental Health. He has also done uh, postgraduate work at Johns Hopkins University in international relations. Uh, he's very active in his own professional organization, very well thought of in that, and takes the lead in several initiatives uh, within that professional organization. Uh, before coming to George Washington University, he had a, a, uh, a very noteworthy career having huge impact on our nation's uh, history over the last several decades. Uh, he. Uh, worked 21 years with the Central Intelligence, Agency, Central Intelligence Agency and actually not only founded but directed a center, the Center for Analysis of Personality and Political Behavior. This was a multidisciplinary behavioral science unit that provided assessments of foreign leadership and their national decision-making decision processes. And, that inf and provided that information to our president and other senior leaders around our country. Uh, there's been many times uh, over, the, over that period of time where uh, his center uh, provided input that, that had, a, had a big impact on the direction we took as a nation. One that I remember uh, you know, right off the top is uh, in the Camp David Accords uh, where he took, personally took a lead role in the profiles of Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin, and provided those to Jimmy Carter uh, that were very, very important in the negotiations at that time. Many of you may have seen him on TV from time to time. He appears, uh, has appeared frequently on most major news programs, uh, 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 addressing topics such as the Unabomber, uh, the uh, uh, Branch Davidian crisis, and on and on and on on, on many subjects. He's, he's published uh, well, uh, his publications are too long for us to discuss in this forum, and, uh, and he's also received many accolades and awards uh, for his positive impact he has made to the security of our nation. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like you to uh, uh, join with me in welcoming uh, Mr. G or Dr. Gerald Post. I'm delighted uh, to be with you to 
discuss something that I believe is of ever greater importance in this area of uh, asymmetric conflict, with the United States now as the sole remaining uh, superpower. Every conflict we become involved in, uh, every adversary we are facing is automatically an asymmetric uh, rival. And this really increases, in my judgment, the need to have very clear understandings of those leaders uh, we are facing. And we have been faced now with not the relative stability of the uh, superpower rivalry, with uh, understandings of the adversary clearly, but increasingly a series of pop-up leaders, Muhammad Farah Deed, uh, uh, su suddenly a, a regional conflict blossoms uh, into, into one with greater implications for us. And the need to deter, uh, the need to influence, uh, the need to at times counter, but in doing so, uh, to do so with uh, fullest understanding of those we are facing is, is crucial. You cannot deter a leader you don't understand. Um, and I'm regularly struck by the amount of resources we uh, put into uh, weapon systems, uh, the amount of resources uh, we put into a large organization such as uh, um, our information warfare uh, centers, uh, but the insufficiency of resources devoted to understanding those leaders who's, who we are trying to influence through information warfare. Uh, and I must say I'm totally delighted uh, with the prospect of this adversaries project, which I strongly support because it's really going to be quite unique uh, uh, and will have implications with way beyond uh, uh, the, uh, the Air Force Counterproliferation Center. The end of the Cold War really has been destabilizing. Um, uh, we've lost our enemies, uh, and it's produced not a peace dividend, but a really quite unpredictable uh, international climate in which rogue leaders of outlaw nations frequently have precipitated major political crises. This, the relatively uh, stable era, as I noted, uh, has been now replaced by one, uh, and there's been a proliferation of destructive power with more destructive power in the hands of small, independent leadership with hostile agendas towards the United States. The most worrisome nations, uh, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, are ruled by unpredictable leaderships. The headlines of the past few years have been dominated by such names as uh, Saddam Hussein, Kim Jong-il, Mohammed Faridi, Radovan Karadzic, Slobodan Milosevic. Several of these leaders already have or are actively seeking weapons of mass destruction. During the Gulf crisis, just consider if we had uh, a clear understanding that uh, Saddam Hussein already possessed, including weaponization, weapons of mass destruction, how differently the dynamics of that conflict would have played out. Former Secretary of Defense Perry referred to the uh, nightmare scenario of a nuclear-armed North uh, Korea. Uh, uh, I was recently uh, at a uh, conference uh, uh, speaking with both uh, uh, at, 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 the at the platform with both the director of uh, counterproliferation at uh, NSC and, uh, uh, and uh, Senator uh, uh, and, and two senators actually uh, and uh, Senator Lugar in particular uh, and several of them said the question in terms of uh, terrorist weapons of mass destruction is not if, but when. And I will be uh, trying to address with you approaches to understanding these leaders and try to make come alive uh, issues of, uh, of uh, how, how much consequential international environment we're in. Think of the uh, Soviet Union at the, uh, as it was uh, declining uh, and uh, Yeltsin's health, quite unpredictable, was uh, uh, so worrisome. We had the prospect, quite real in terms of popular support at one time, of a uh, Zhirinovsky uh, with his uh, finger on the uh, nuclear uh, button. In addressing the challenge of uh, effective coercive diplomacy, Alex George stressed the importance of having clear mo uh, models of adversary psychology. Uh, to think of coercive diplomacy 
uh, one cannot generically coerce an adversary. A tactic designed to coerce uh, adversary A may stimulate and be counterproductive for adversary B. And to uncritically extrapolate from the uh, uh, era of, uh, of deterrence based on uh, weapons, of, of based on uh, uh, mutual assured destruction, and you, to you employ some of this psychology, quite appropriate uh, in countering the Soviet Union, and apply it to a Saddam Hussein, uh, a Muammar uh, a Gaddafi, and Osama bin Laden, is designed to have counterproductive effects. Furthermore, we're in an era of uh, uh, instant communication. Regularly, we see communications within the United States designed for a domestic audience to reassure us, uh, uh, to uh, steal our will, which have quite counterproductive uh, uh, effects abroad. And counterproductive in terms of things designed to reassure us may in fact be seen as points uh, for the um, adversary. Consider again uh, the, uh, the Gulf crisis with uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, when uh, President Bush uh, took on this, uh, the leadership dur during this really critical era and, and provided indeed quite remarkable leadership in speaking basically to the American public and talking about the evil Saddam Hussein and, uh, and we, I, will be uh, doing everything possible to, c to control this threat to world security. He was promoting Saddam Hussein and every time that happened there was in fact uh, an increase in prestige for Saddam Hussein as radical Arab leader who had the courage to stand up to the mightiest nation on earth and that most powerful uh, leader of that mightiest uh, nation. So one has to be considering multiple audiences uh, and, uh, and the impact of these messages on these, on these audiences. Um, in order to counter such leaders then, as they promote deadly uh, conflict, clear actor-specific models of their psychology and decision-making is an absolute requisite. Now, um, another major issue that has uh, confronted us is the requirement to counter low-intensity conflict. Because despite the military conflict in the Gulf, and more recently in Bosnia and Kosovo, many political experts are persuaded that low-intensity conflict insurgencies and terrorism will increasingly be a prominent feature of that international uh, environment in the 21st century and occupy our attention. Consider the bombing of the World Trade Center uh, in Manhattan, of the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. I recently had the opportunity of testifying in federal court uh, in the uh, bombing of the, uh, uh, for the trial of uh, one of the terrorists responsible for the bombing of the uh, Tanzanian, uh, uh, our embassy in Tanzania. And it was really quite a fascinating uh, uh, experience. And realizing what had led him into this pathway made much more powerfully clear to me, and I had the opportunity of interviewing him uh, 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 for upwards of 20 hours, as well as one of the other members of the group, uh, how, what a ripe climate there is of young, uh, ingenuous individuals ready to be manipulated uh, to enter uh, the path of terrorism. Just to, uh, I'll be talking about terrorism in general later, but just to make one note con concerning uh, my, my dealing uh, with him. After he'd gone to the uh, camp uh, in Afghanistan uh, to, uh, to receive training, he had been stimulated in the mosque to the need to be a good Muslim uh, and to protect the uh, Muslims who are being victimized in Chechnya, the Muslims who are being victimized uh, uh, in Bosnia, and he had seen pictures of the combat and tanks rolling in. He wanted to be a soldier uh, for Islam, to defend the uh, victimized Islam, Muslims. He was uh, not able to get one of these assignments, came back, worked as an assistant clerk in a grocery store. One day, someone who had met him there came up to him and uh, said, Sort of like someone might come to you and say, would you like to do lunch? Would you like to do a jihad job? Um, and uh, he said, yes, yes, and accepted this. And that was all he knew. He had no idea the target 
uh, was um, even in Tanzania uh, or in the, uh, in the United States. And when later on he asked the leader of this cell, uh, say, what is this jihad job? Uh, he was not an Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, but the uh, Al-Qaeda member who was running this cell looked at him coldly and said, uh, your job is not to ask questions. Your job is to follow instructions. This is my instruction now. Get me a Fanta. So this was, and, and the, the orange drink, uh, uh, th this, is, this was a low-level uh, uh, gopher uh, who got the meals who rented the safe house in his name, everyone else was an, an, an alias, and this was the one guy who got nailed as an example of how ingenuous uh, he was. Uh, uh, he was instructed to clean up after everyone else flew back to uh, Pakistan, and uh, included was the food grinder, which was used to grind up the dynamite. But that seemed a wasteful thing to him, and he thought his mother could use that, uh, and uh, he, uh, he managed to get the food grinder to his mother, where it was found later with dynamite trace on him. So, a good and loving son, and that was important to understand. Well, let me uh, note one other um, uh, observation, that the tendency uh, to have this uh, international scene preoccupied by, uh, uh, by uh, really not well-known leaders emphasizes something else, a capacity, a need to have a capacity to have rapid profiling techniques. And there are uh, rapid uh, profiling techniques available in academia, which really have not yet been fully incorporated uh, uh, into the uh, uh, national uh, security world. This is the era of information warfare. Uh, I regularly lecture at the National Defense University on this topic. Again, in this era, with this massive mechanism, it is quite extraordinary to me that th the pillar of, uh, uh, of information warfare, altering the perceptions of our adversaries, uh, affecting their will and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in their psychologies, uh, must rest on understanding our adversaries, their will, uh, and their uh, perceptions. And we don't have that capacity. So I, again, applaud uh, this effort uh, uh, by Dr. Schneider, because I believe it has really, uh, can really provide leadership in restoring to the U.S. government what has been, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, very much uh, diminished at a time when it's needed uh, more than ever. Let me uh, illustrate with a few uh, rogue leaders. Uh, um, let's see, where are we? Uh, I'm not sure about some of these. Uh, that we, we are concerned about uh, Saddam, and I'm not sure B Bashar Assad would now appreciate being considered a rogue leader, but we'll have to think about that. Um, but look at this interesting um, gallery. Um, consider uh, in uh, Iran, for example, Ayatollah Khatami, uh, the moderate, uh, with an extremist, if we can consider him a moderate, uh, uh, versus Khomeini. How, how can we help shift the balance to uh, not a rogue leader, but a leader in a rogue state, uh, to Khatami, away from the extremity of the, uh, of the influence of uh, Khomeini? It means understanding not just their two psychologies, but what they are appealing to within the leadership circles. One of the goals of um, information operations has to be to weaken the connections between a leader and his inner circle and his followers, to shift the balance in, in the population of support towards moderation uh, versus uh, support for uh, extremity. Easier said than done, because in fact, um, to be explicitly favoring Katami uh, would be to be providing uh, a, a nourishment and enthusiastic support for, uh, for Khomeini. Uh, uh, so how do we, using a hidden hand, shift these uh, balances? Now that means having a clear understanding, as one is uh, assessing uh, any nation, not only of the leaders, but the leadership circle, uh, those who support them, uh, the, the economic elite, uh, the political elite, the military elite, uh, Saddam Hussein, we are hoping to be starting a, uh, 
a, a project shortly where we are going to link a nuanced, updated portrait of Saddam Hussein with a differentiated understanding of the information environment in which he is operating. Now let me give you some understandings of Saddam Hussein uh, just to place in context uh, the kind of understanding that's necessary in terms of linking and delinking him uh, uh, to uh, key individuals and supporters in his environment. I had the opportunity of testifying twice before Congress during, during the crisis on the profile it developed of uh, Saddam Hussein. And this was an interesting uh, time within the United States because suddenly out of nowhere, it seemed, this leader emerged who really uh, had uh, the world in the grip uh, 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 of his hands. So when he, uh, after invading uh, uh, Kuwait, uh, as our economy uh, was really a t uh, very much in, uh, in, in jeopardy, uh, one guttural grunt by him uh, led to the uh, oil barrels, uh, uh, oil prices rising by 15 or 20 dollars a barrel, the Dow Jones plunging 150 points. What an exultant trip. But, but I want to emphasize that trip because in my judgment, uh, Kuwait quickly went off the screen uh, for Saddam. And you can't really understand this without understanding Saddam in the context of his life. His life indeed was a very troubled one, uh, uh, going back to the, uh, to the very beginnings. His father died during his mother's pregnancy with him. And uh, uh, according to Israeli sources, uh, his uh, brother, a year older, uh, died of cancer uh, during the same too. So he was, he was born to a mother uh, depressed, uh, isolated, and there is some reason to believe she either tried to commit suicide and or abort herself of Saddam. Um, uh, a year later, she married, uh, as was the custom in Iraq, the brother of her, uh, uh, of her dead husband who quickly began to abuse young Saddam, uh, physically and psychologically. Uh, Saddam had a resilient personality, and at age nine, fled this abusive household and went to the home of his uncle Khairala, uh, his maternal uh, uncle, who played a very restorative role for Saddam talked with him about the glory of his family in, in Iraqi history, talked with him uh, about uh, Saladin, uh, who uh, liberated uh, Jerusalem uh, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and filled him with feelings after this dreadful background uh, uh, that he could play a glorious role uh, in, the, in the future uh, of, uh, of Iraq. When uh, he entered high school years, he, they moved to Baghdad at a time of particular importance. This was the era when um, uh, Nasser had just come to power, uh, and the streets were alive with uh, feelings of exultation that at last uh, uh, the Arab world would have the kind of leader it needed. And uh, so young Nasser, as a model of uh, the radical, unifying Arab leader, was to become uh, really a central feature in Saddam Hussein's own personal uh, identification. And he saw himself someday as following this pathway. Without going into great details uh, over his uh, subsequent career, except to say uh, that his use of violence, uh, he had a reputation of being a thug, was one of the things which brought him positively to the attention of the Ba'athist Party um, leadership. And ultimately, uh, played a key role in uh, taking over uh, the reins of, uh, of Iraq in a coup, playing, however, a second-in-command uh, um, role, but being really the power behind the scenes. The coup could not have been successfully accomplished without the covert uh, assistance uh, of the uh, uh, chief of uh, intelligence for the, uh, 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 the Iraqi uh, uh, staff uh, present. Uh, uh, as his reward uh, for assisting them uh, uh, to take over the reins of Iraq, uh, he was first put in exile and then, uh, uh, and then executed by, uh, uh, by Saddam. So 
the issue of loyalty uh, is a rather a one-way street uh, uh, for Saddam. When Saddam ultimately took over the reins of, uh, of, of power directly, uh, an event occurred which has really important implications. One of the things that bothered uh, many of our leader, well, much of our leadership, and you may recall the phrase, the madman of the Middle East uh, was uh, echoing around. And, and what I emphasized in my testimony before Congress in the profile that I did, which I might note was done totally from open source material. There's a great deal of material out there on all of these leaders which is being insufficiently uh, attended to in understanding the patterns of their lives. But one of the points I emphasized was that while he was not deranged, while he was not psychotic, was indeed a rational political calculator. In fact, he often miscalculated for two reasons. And the two reasons were, A, he had a very narrow view uh, of the international climate and tended to see the world through uh, Arab eyes. He'd only been outside of Iraq twice, once to Moscow and uh, once to Paris on a shopping trip with his wife. But more importantly, he was surrounded by a group of sycophants who uh, were his window on the world and told him not what he needed to hear, but told him what he wanted to, fear, to hear because they were afraid for good reasons, which I'll uh, identify for you, that to constructively criticize a plan that he offered was likely to lead them not only to lose their jobs, but potentially to lose their lives. Episode the first. At this initial meeting, uh, a, lar a cabinet meeting, a large room, many uh, uh, times the size of this auditorium, and I want you to put yourselves um, in the shoes of uh, one of his cabinet ministers after he just took over, some 200 people in the, in the, uh, in the room, cabinet, sub-cabinet level. Um, he was a very suspicious man, paranoid, again, not paranoid crazy, but paranoid, suspicious, fearing uh, conspiracies around him wherever he looked. There were 21 members of this group that he did not trust. He arrested one of these 21 and also put this man's family under house arrest. Um, and um, uh, told this man that he would publicly confess to a plot against uh, Saddam, uh, naming the other 20 uh, participants in this non-existent plot, uh, or his family would be killed. The man agreed. And as the man stood up there uh, in front of the auditorium, uh, Saddam was sitting there, and this is on film, it's quite remarkable, uh, luxuriantly smoking a cigar with a quiet smile on his face. Uh, and this man goes through all 200 names in the, uh, uh, in the auditorium. Was uh, Bashar uh, a, uh, uh, a participant in the coup attempt? No, he was not. Uh, uh, was... Uh, uh, Farah, a, uh, a participant uh, in the coup. Yes, he was. At this point, two security members come, pluck that individual out of his chair, and bring back. Everyone by now is totally terrified. And he went one by one through every name in that auditorium. Was he a participant, uh, yes or no? Then um, uh, Saddam praised the rest of the group uh, for their loyalty to him and indicated that uh, they would now have the opportunity to kill the enemies of the regime and divided up the remaining uh, members uh, into, uh, into teams and had them form the firing squad the next morning uh, to kill uh, these members of the conspiracy, uh, the non-existent conspiracy. This uh, was a rather remarkable uh, demonstration. Episode the second. In 1982, uh, the war which Saddam had started with uh, Iran was going badly. Um, missiles were raining on Baghdad. Uh, Saddam said, we have to have peace. Uh, and was quite alarmed at the course of this and the danger to his country. But by now Khomeini was obsessed with Saddam uh, and said there will be no peace with Iraq until Saddam is gone. He either steps down voluntarily or must be uh, deposed. So uh, Saddam uh, called the cabinet meeting. Gentlemen, we have a dilemma. Uh, we need peace. Uh, 
But uh, Khomeini says there'll be no peace until I'm no longer president. What say you? And everyone, of course, to a man said, Saddam is Iraq, Iraq is Saddam. We cannot have uh, uh, a country without you at its leader, a uh, well, well, wonderful leader. Uh, and uh, Osama said, well, yes, yes, yes. But I really want your frank, candid, and creative suggestions. Uh, and uh, Saddam uh, uh, heard from his Oxford-educated uh, Minister of Health, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, well, Saddam, you might want to think about stepping down temporarily until our goal of peace is achieved and then resuming the presidency. Pretty shrewd idea, I thought. Uh, 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 and uh, apparently Saddam didn't think so. Uh, uh, he th gravely thanked the man for his candor and had him arrested on the spot. The minister's wife came to Saddam and pled with him, please, please, Saddam, my husband has always been loyal to you. He remains loyal to you. There's never been a question about his loyalty. Please return my husband to me. And he was deeply touched by this plea, uh, a man of great compassion. Uh, and he said, and he promised her that he would return her husband to her, which he did the next day. As best I can tell, the only promise he's ever kept. He returned her husband to her in a black canvas body bag chopped into pieces. Now this powerfully concentrated the attention of the uh, other uh, ministers uh, who to a man uh, indicated that uh, Saddam must remain as the, uh, as the president. The war went on for another uh, bloody uh, 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 six years. It's not entirely clear whether or not that uh, story is true. Uh, uh, another version is he thanked him for his candor, brought him out to uh, the outside uh, of the, the corridor, outside the conference room, and put a bullet through his head, sort of like The Godfather, which, by the way, is reputed to be not only his favorite movie, but, a, uh, 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 but a, his, his training film. Uh, so uh, the, the, the fear uh, of his advisors leads them uh, to be quite tremulous and highly reluctant to criticize an excessive mood, uh, move by Saddam uh, in any way. And we really don't know, uh, we can infer for some how we might feel, but we really don't know how much loyalty there is, or is it a loyalty com uh, uh, compelled by, 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 by fear. Um, but this kind of climate seriously interferes with his ability to, uh, to evaluate uh, uh, political reality. He can be quite in touch psychologically. If we gave him psychological tests, he would prove out to be normal in terms of being in touch with reality, but quite out of touch with reality in terms of what's going on in the world because of the filter being the sycophantic leadership circle. And that emphasizes quite importantly, you cannot assess merely the leader. You must look at the leadership circle, the nature of the relationships, who is chosen, how much tension there is. Is there a way of shifting the balance between this uh, cadre of leaders? I once had the uh, opportunity behind the scenes of supporting um, Max Kampelman um, in Geneva with the START negotiations. And they were all preoccupied, really, with uh, uh, launch on warning, throw away to, uh, tech to technological issues that they were negotiating with the Soviets. But as I was going through the transcripts, we were able to identify a major cleft in, this, in the Soviet negotiating venue, those who were somewhat softer, those who were much more automatons responding to the uh, guidelines coming out of Moscow, and raised as a suggestion, what are the ways in which we can magnify that cleft and increase the uh, visibility and salience of, uh, of, the more, uh, of, of, of the group that is more inclined to favor the positions we're interested in moving. So there's a great deal that can be done uh, behaviorally. Now, let me go on to talk about the dynamic of the conflict, because I think it's really quite, Im quite important. In the first place, uh, when Saddam moved to enter Kuwait, he had come to see this as his response uh, to an economic war that had been declared. There's a very interesting nine-page glossy pamphlet uh, 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 printed up by his Minister of uh, Information uh, that describes the uh, plot uh, that had developed. Uh, when, despite U.S. Uh, intervention uh, and assistance uh, to Iran, as proved later by the uh, 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 Arms for Hostages uh, 
uh, deal and, uh, and something in which President Bush was clearly um, uh, involved, there was a major attempt to undermine uh, militarily Iraq and the Iran-Iraq war. Um, when this failed, despite the best U.S. Uh, efforts, uh, and the U.S. was involved uh, with uh, Israel in this, uh, in this uh, military conspiracy, uh, economic warfare uh, became the next strategy, and the Gulf states were recruited as agents uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, conspiracy. When Kuwait refused to yield to the demands of uh, Iraq uh, over uh, uh, the disputed areas in terms of the uh, oil wells, uh, uh, this was uh, an attempt to destroy, this was economic warfare, an attempt to destroy the Iraqi uh, community. Our, the Iraqi uh, economy. And uh, as a consequence, uh, what else was uh, Saddam to do but, do but to defend himself, as anyone has the right to do, for, in, this, in this economic uh, warfare? Uh, the paranoid disposition, not paranoid crazy again, but the paranoid disposition says everything that happens I, uh, is my enemies against me, and I am required to uh, respond to them. Well, one can respond to enemies real and imagined, and in the process, um, end up creating enemies. And this indeed happened. Uh, uh, and in fact, there were enemies out there, but he uh, had an interesting capacity for enemy magnification uh, and, uh, and was very adroit at this uh, uh, indeed. When he invaded Kuwait, what was startling to him, I believe, was the magnitude of the international response. And it's important to emphasize, let's go back now to how, how deeply instilled in him uh, the, uh, the dreams of glory were uh, by his uncle, and uh, someday succeeding Nasser as the, as the preeminent leader of the Arab world. Uh, suddenly, this, this, but he had, he had been ignored. He believed he should be ranked as one of the great socialist leaders for what he had accomplished within the streets of Iraq, uh, 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 there were these, uh, one could get lost not knowing whether to turn on, a, on a, a Saddam Hussein Avenue, Saddam Hussein Road, or Saddam Hussein Boulevard, uh, and large pictures of him wherever he went. When he was asked, why do, why do you do this? He said, uh, how do, uh, what, what is this about by a reporter? He said, well, they want to do this for me. I, I, I just let them do that. Uh, you know, I, I can't help it, really. Uh, I, I don't want this, but that's the way they feel about me. Um, and and uh, it, that was a, a permissive kind of thing. Um, but really, the cult of personality was quite, quite great within, the, within, within Iraq. And yet, he hadn't had real recognition outside of Iraq until this event. Um, the, in particular, what was quite remarkable, he had been no friend of the Palestinians over the years, had not made major contributions to them. With the faltering leadership of uh, Arafat, um, he was seen as a hero by the Palestinian people. And in the uh, rooftops uh, uh, in Jordan, um, uh, uh, in the occupied territories, the, pa uh, the Palestinian people were seeing themselves having a new liberator, <coughs> feeding again this not yet realized concept of Saddam Hussein as the current day Saladin, as the liberator of uh, Jerusalem. And he played this to a fairly well. But I believe one way of constructing what happened was that he had finally achieved the greatness he had long aspired to and, and, and yet had, had, had escaped him. So when he uh, was faced with uh, the threats of this massive uh, retaliation militarily, uh, unless, he, uh, unless he left Kuwait, that was, uh, 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 what, what was to happen? Was he, was he to, uh, to say uh, to the world, forgive me, gentlemen, I was excessive, I will go back to my previous obscurity, uh, 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 thank you for permitting me to escape. Uh, it was impossible because Basically, what, what the command was translated to him uh, to be uh, was uh, give up your world prominence, capitulate, and when George Bush pounded the desk uh, and said there will be no face saving, in the Arab world this made for uh, uh, an impossible uh, situation. 
In the profile we wrote, we uh, indicated that there had been at least four occasions where he had been pragmatically able to reverse himself uh, when he saw that a move uh, was uh, being counterproductive, but could only do so if two conditions were met. A, that he would retain his power, and B, that he would retain his reputation. In effect, uh, the way this was orchestrated internationally backed him into a, a, a corner and almost made it uh, necessary uh, for him to defend himself. But we need also to remember what winning means in the Arab context. Uh, when uh, Sadat, uh, in the uh, 73 war, uh, uh, invaded, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, quite surprising Israel, um, ultimately being defeated, it brought great honor uh, to him. You can win by losing, by having the courage to stand up against a superior foe. Uh, in fact, after the uh, uh, bombing campaign began, uh, after uh, uh, five days, there was a press conference that Saddam held talking about this mother of all victories. Uh, you know, they, they were absolutely shattered uh, militarily. Uh, it was said that Iraq could only hold out for two days against the onslaught uh, from the Alliance. We have already held out for five days. With each passing day, the magnitude of our victory becomes greater. So one has to be able to translate culturally what the impact is and to not westernize. The same problems that Saddam had in understanding the Western world, I believe we had in understanding the, uh, the environment in which, uh, in which he was uh, living. Saddam represented, in my judgment, uh, a, a particularly dangerous personality type, one of the most dangerous there is, and especially when you find it in a, in a political uh, leader. Uh, the, the name of this type uh, is called uh, uh, malignant narcissism. That's a juicy phrase, uh, but let me describe what it, uh, what it uh, connotes. A, such extreme self-absorption that there is no capacity to understand the pain or suffering of others. And in fact, one of the things we were faced with was his perfectly comfortable willingness to have masses of uh, Iraqi casualties uh, 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 because of his strong belief, not without merit, uh, that the United States had a, quote, Vietnam complex and were reluctant to lose a single American life. Uh, and so that if, if he could engage us in a, uh, in a uh, uh, a ground battle, uh, uh, and particularly the prospect of using uh, weapons of mass destruction and, and inflicting deaths through, uh, uh, through uh, 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 nerve gas, uh, uh, this would produce a, a horrified reaction within the United States, which in turn uh, would lead to a political stalemate and which would mean a victory uh, for him. So extreme self-absorption. Secondly, uh, a paranoid streak, not paranoid psychosis, but a willingness, but a belief that they're out there to get me and I must defend myself. Thirdly, an absence of conscience. Uh, uh, I used to uh, say that a Saddam Hussein had a Swiss cheese conscience, uh, uh, huge gaping holes in it, but I believe that was a compliment that uh, was exaggerated, unwarranted. I've been able to find no evidence of anything resembling a, a conscience uh, uh, in the man. Uh, and f and uh, finally, uh, uh, a willingness without uh, qualms to use whatever aggression is necessary to accomplish his goals. He justifies this all in terms of, the, of revolutionary pragmatism, but it really means what is necessary for his survival. Now, there have been a number of uh, uh, Estimates saying that he suffered from a Masada complex would uh, would uh, would commit uh, suicide. Uh, uh, indeed, I see no evidence of that, and uh, uh, but do uh, in fact see that when he says uh, Saddam is Iraq, Iraq is Saddam, it's absolutely true in him. There's no distinction between that psychologically for him and what's good for Saddam is good for Iraq. Uh, period. So he's never going to leave, and the uh, only way he will be. Uh, 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 taken out is, uh, is, is feet first. Uh, but think for a moment about the environment surrounding Saddam. We have on the one hand uh, the loyalists from his uh, uh, Tikriti uh, uh, background. 
uh, the, we have his family, and a very interesting family it is, uh, the issue of his um, um, uh, sons-in-law uh, who uh, defected uh, and then returned at his invitation. Uh, uh, I wrote an op-ed piece called uh, Assisted Suicide Iraqi Style uh, uh, concerning this. Uh, uh, his dealings with his daughter, with his brother-in-law. Uh, we, we saw within the United States the impact of, uh, of an affair upon our politics. It plays out slightly differently uh, in Iraq. Uh, he became, Saddam became very attracted to the wife of a prominent uh, Iraqi businessman and uh, uh, as, uh, as a token of his uh, esteem for the businessman made him president of Air Iraq. When his brother-in-law, Saddam's brother-in-law, his uh, his wife's uh, brother, uh, 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 prote who was the Minister of Defense, protested uh, that her, uh, uh, his, uh, his sister was being dishonored on the next tour he was making of the country uh, uh, with a helicopter. The helicopter mysteriously crashed, and it's widely believed that Saddam uh, uh, arranged uh, uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this crash. So uh, there's uh, uh, an interesting, almost total invulnerability this man feels, but is ready to strike out at critics, real and imagined, uh, and uh, has places a, a large value, though, in being a respected world leader. So we have circle. We have the economic elite. We have the military elite. We have the special uh, security guards. We, ha we have the uh, Republican guards, uh, the military in general, uh, and, the, and the public. Each of these has different psychologies collectively. How do we couch messages to appeal to those groups, diminish the impact uh, of the powerful connection, including fear of uh, Saddam, for these, uh, for these groups so as to shift the balance of opinion? A major goal in terms of deterring leaders, who, how even a totalitarian leader needs his supporters, uh, especially he needs his supporters, is how do we shift the balance within that, within that support circle? And that means a nuanced understanding of the uh, information environment around the leader, taking the traits of that leader which are particularly vulnerable, and being able to get messages into the system which uh, play to, that, uh, 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 to those audiences in a way they can digest it. Uh, Khomeini uh, brilliantly uh, did a psyops job within uh, uh, Iraq, within uh, within Iran, using uh, audio tapes, which circulated uh, widely uh, within the country to get rumors into a uh, uh, a circle concerning leaders uh, in his inner circle that he can't uh, trust is designed to make a, for an incendiary uh, uh, a problem for this already paranoid man. So there's a great deal that can be done and should be done, but you can't do it without a understanding where he is psychologically, and B, understanding the psychology of the uh, groups uh, uh, around him. And this becomes quite critical. And it's quite critical in couching messages uh, that we not end up uh, inadvertently supporting uh, the very thing he wishes to accomplish, as I believe happened to some degree during, during the crisis in terms of the personalization um, uh, of, of the conflict. Uh, and quite important to, uh, to make this uh, a situation where it's his prestige within uh, the international uh, community, which he very wants to be seen as a respected member of, that, 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 is, that, that is a threat, uh, not him as leader for his radical Arab constituency. Well, let me... Uh, Pause for a moment for any questions uh, uh, about uh, about Saddam uh, and uh, how one would turn a nuanced assessment uh, into the resource for uh, for one's approach. Barry, um, how would you? Uh, okay, sure. What what kinds of uh, groups do you see as target groups? Uh, within Iraq that one might use PSYOPs against to separate him from his, his followers? Well, I, I mentioned a few of the target groups. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have different layers. We have most immediately those from his, uh, his region. Um, 
the, uh, uh, his family uh, in particular. And while one might not be able to break the ties between his family and him, one can lead to disputes perhaps between family members. And in fact, there is some evidence uh, uh, of tensions between his, uh, his sons now. Um, the uh, uh, special security guards are a very important source of support who in some ways are resented by the broader circle of the Republican guards. One then has the military itself, which, represent, which he needs to support him, but, by, but in which he is much less confident uh, uh, in terms of them, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, have, have been very frustrated uh, uh, in terms of having their resources uh, destroyed. Uh, uh, and we, we, we have reason to believe there are tensions in leadership there. But again, it's a very difficult intelligence environment in which to uh, operate. And finally, we have the economic elite, uh, uh, who the isolation of Iraq in the world uh, does remain a problem, even though he kind of snubs his uh, uh, nose at the world. And, uh, uh, and, and the, there is this disparity there, and the public at, at, at large, as well as other Arab nations in the radical fold. So each of these is a, each of these is a source of influence, a source of, uh, uh, a source of threat, uh, and, uh, and how, and each would have different levers to be pushing once one understands what those levers are. So we're talking now about something that goes way beyond, in my judgment, um, as the individual leadership assessment, We're talking about social psychological assessment of each of these audiences at a distance. Uh, and how do we do that? And what are some of the techniques for doing that? And, and that's a, a very challenging, uh, but not impossible prospect. Sir. If uh, he's uh, taken out uh, or assassinated, and not necessarily by our government, but by another government, um, who will you mean another government, a small one in the neighborhood that yes. happens to be alive with us often? Okay. Uh, um, who will take his place? Do you see anyone that, and will he be any different, or he or she? Well, that's, that's an interesting question, and that's one that concerns uh, many. Uh, in fact, uh, he is not alone, uh, and uh, uh, there are many who have been schooled in his leadership uh, techniques, share his view uh, of the world. Would they have the same capacity uh, to provide unifying leadership uh, that, that he does, uh, or, or would there be uh, some fragmentation of the regime? To go another step, however, if, uh, uh, one of the unfortunate things we uh, often do as a nation is to personalize the leadership, which is sort of a b behind your, your question, in a sense. Um, and this not only strengthens the leader, but it ends up uh, persuading uh, the American public, uh, if only we got rid of, let's see, how many uh, 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 enemies of the day have we had? Uh, uh, Gaddafi, uh, and now actually Saddam is not our number one enemy, it's Osama bin Laden, right? Um, uh, and the, this, this, the current madman of the Middle East, peace would break out if we only got rid of this guy. And as you're pointing out, uh, uh, he exists in a leadership culture. There would be others picking up the reins who would be able uh, to certainly use the same power and control he had to a significant degree. Uh, uh, but I don't think the succession is, by, uh, is at all clear uh, to us. And uh, would there be a succession struggle? Could we do something to help promote that succession uh, 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 struggle and weaken the regime uh, f further? To take another step, though, the, the Iraq exists within a context. We are quite concerned about the radical regime in Iran. Uh, if we weaken too much Iraq, uh, does that mean that we have uh, a, a radical uh, 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 Islamic Shiite uh, uh, hegemony over the Gulf, which poses even greater dangers, et cetera, et cetera? So this is a very complicated uh, issue. Uh, uh, and. Uh, and, and it is difficult to foretell how, uh, how, how matters would play out. Mm. Yes. Host, I have one question. In regards to the definition of winning, winning by losing most of your infrastructure and whatever other assets he lost, he won by holding out. That's in his viewpoint. Do his people 
hold that viewpoint in reality and what are the views of the other Arab leaders? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the degree to which uh, this is a widespread feeling. And I think the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, uh, his courage uh, in holding out was fine, but I find it difficult to believe that what was at one point, what I think the fifth most powerful uh, army uh, uh, on the face of the earth, really had uh, uh, a significant uh, uh, depletion of, it, of, its, uh, of its technical uh, capabilities. Um, the uh, uh, people whose houses were blasted to smithereens who are now uh, suffering in the streets, but what influence do they have? Uh, so I, I would uh, say within certain, uh, within other radical Arab nations, there was great uh, honor to him for doing this. Some of his people uh, continue to honor him in this way. Others uh, probably uh, feel quite devastated by what occurred. We really don't know clearly, and this is a problem in dealing with this closed uh, uh, information um, uh, environment. But I think one has to believe that there are uh, uh, potentially dissident groups within the military uh, who see their once proud stature having been seriously diminished uh, and, and, uh, and, and many poor decisions having been made. Let me uh, note, uh, and then we'll take a, a brief break, uh, the question has been raised, why uh, didn't he use uh, uh, nerve gas during, as, th as things were going badly? And I believe our PSYOPs did play a role here uh, in that, uh, and this was battlefield psychological operations, and we, we, uh, we did this quite constructively in terms of uh, uh, making it clear that any regional commander who participated in this would be, it would be subject to uh, international war crimes uh, uh, sanctions. And the uh, combination of breaking down command and control uh, and sending out messages to, uh, that was picked up locally uh, significantly kept uh, this from happening. But we have a very complicated situation uh, indeed, and, uh, uh, and we need to be influencing it as much as, uh, as, as possible. And to do that, we have to understand this man, where he is now, where his leadership circle is. And we, we, uh, that means a nuanced intelligence effort and an analytic effort, such as now only this adversary's project can do. All right, let's break now for a few moments. Let me, before we uh, shift to the terrorism uh, topic, note my comments uh, concerning the PSYOP uh, success uh, in Iraq. We really refer to tactical battlefield PSYOP. If we uh, had some successes in that battle, there was zero to no attention given to strategic PSYOPs and any uh, uh, significant attention given to the vulnerable audiences, and in that war for uh, public opinion, uh, Saddam Hussein won hands down, just as uh, in the conflict uh, uh, over Kosovo. Um, Milosevic was surely uh, a, a, a strategic communications expert at a time when we were countering his, uh, his effective war uh, uh, of words um, uh, with bombs, uh, in, in the way he portrayed himself as identified with Tito, as the way he identified himself uh, with Prince Lazar, the uh, strong hero of the, uh, um, of the besieged uh, Serbs against the Muslim infidels, um, um, he quite brilliantly orchestrated a, an information campaign which strengthened his uh, support at home. Um, so the issue that we're really talking about is strategic uh, uh, information operations as being critical here and depending upon this. This uh, could not be 
uh, more important uh, than in the era, uh, than in this era of low intensity conflict with reference to terrorism. I've put a definition here. Terrorism is premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups of clandestine state agents. Terrorism involves a criminal act that is often, indeed usually, symbolic in uh, nature, intended to influence an audience beyond the immediate victims. That's a complicated definition, but I want you to uh, note several aspects of it. The goal of the communication and its violence as communication is not the victims of the violence. Um, this means that terrorism really basically is uh, uh, a uh, particularly vicious species of psychological warfare waged through the media. Uh, you don't counter psychological warfare with Delta Forces. You counter psychological warfare with counter psychological warfare. And in my judgment, the prime uh, method of countering uh, terrorism ought be PSYOPs. And we're not doing this nearly, uh, nearly sufficiently. But to do that well, one has to understand uh, the spectrum of terrorisms, plural, uh, because each of the terrorisms is different. Uh, uh, it must be understood in its context. And uh, I'll lead you into that spectrum. First, let me note here, there really are four different targets uh, of terrorism. There's the target of the violence itself, uh, the passengers on Pan Am 103, uh, the, uh, uh, the judge uh, in Colombia who's taken out by the narcotic, the, the uh, narco terrorists. Um, but the target of terror are those who belong to that class. So the uh, 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 travel industry was uh, almost destroyed, those who specialized in European travel after PNM 103, and uh, American tourists decided to see America first uh, um, that, uh, that summer and massively canceled uh, flights. The uh, other judges in Colombia uh, are chastened by what happened to their brother judge uh, and may uh, not be quite so harsh as he had been uh, in dealing uh, with the narco traffic counties uh, uh, the next time around. The target of compliance. This is a particularly important one. Uh, when uh, the uh, TWA uh, plane was hijacked um, uh, in uh, Kuwait, um, the demand was for the United States to free the Kuwaiti 7. Uh, the radical Palestinian terrorists who had been, uh, 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 who were incarcerated in Kuwaiti jails. Unless you, the United States, get these uh, 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 freedom fighters freed, we will kill hostages uh, on this plane. Now this episode also uh, indicated something else, which is that the media are not merely uh, separate uh, uh, conduits of uh, 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 reporting. They are the prime target of manipulation. They are the goal. You can't have terrorism in a totalitarian state. Uh, what does it mean, uh, if you go back to that old philosophical uh, conundrum, if a tree falls in the forest uh, and there's no one there to watch us, uh, does it make a sound? If a terrorist uh, act is uh, conducted and it's not reported and then no one knows about it, is it really a terrorist act? And the answer is, well, it's certainly a failed terrorist act. So we didn't really see terrorism in the Soviet Union until Glasnost and Perestroika started uh, when, it, when, the, when the population uh, communication uh, opened up. Let me uh, back up for just the, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, I neglected to mention the target of influence. That's really quite important. That's the goal of most terrorist events, is to communicate to the target of influence. Often the West uh, or uh, the establishment, uh, in some cases uh, uh, a particular uh, a political party or, or group, uh, 
And there's an interesting implication of this for counterproliferation, which I would note, and I'll come to at the end of this uh, discussion. If the goal is to cause positive attention to your cause, then uh, too many casualties could be counterproductive for your cause. So for some of these groups, I believe there is an inherent disincentive to have too many casualties. The goal of terrorism is not to kill people. It's to get attention to their cause. Uh, and, uh, and we see some real <coughs> tensions there. And it's only a few groups who have crossed the, the threshold into mass casualty terrorism. And again, one can have mass casualties without using weapons of mass destruction. And the weapons of mass destruction, uh, so-called, can be used to target a narrow audience. It's actually a poor term, weapons of mass destruction terrorism. And we're probably better off talking about CBRN uh, uh, terrorism, chemical, biological, radiological, um, and, uh, and nuclear. So this target of influence is important. One of the important targets of influence for a particularly dangerous group, the religious fundamentalist uh, terrorists, uh, is not here on Earth. Uh, their goal is to uh, uh, influence the, uh, the deity. Uh, and one of the reasons, it is probably the case in, in the last uh, 10, 15 years that there's been an increase in the frequency of terrorist actions which, uh, for which no responsibility is claimed. Um, you don't need a New York Times uh, headline or a story on, the, uh, on, on CNN uh, claiming credit for this group uh, if your goal is to influence God. God knows, after all. Uh, so uh, uh, this is probably one of the reasons that we have seen an increase in religious fundamentalist uh, terrorism, particularly uh, Islamist terrorism. Uh, and uh, this is a particularly dangerous uh, type of terrorism, and one which is one of the prime dangers, in fact, uh, in connection with the WMD terrorism. Uh, not in terms of the prime danger, but less constrained than the other groups, just because there is no disincentive uh, with uh, uh, their uh, national uh, constituencies. So we. Uh, can consider it then the particularly vicious species of psychological warfare waged through the media. Now, in uh, uh, this five-year period, uh, uh, the threshold of casualties, wh while the frequency of international terrorism has been dropping, there's been at the same time an increase in lethality. So in many ways, the threshold, going back to the Air India, uh, uh, Airbus uh, 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 destroyed uh, in, in India, uh, where we're talking about 200, 300 people killed, that threshold has already been crossed by a number of groups. I want to note, even though there's great concern about Osama bin Laden as orchestrator of weapons of mass destruction terrorism, his mass casualties, the World Trade Center, the uh, bombings in, uh, at the Kobar Towers, the uh, embassies in uh, Kenya and Tanzania, were caused by conventional uh, bombs. One of the worst uh, episodes uh, in terms of domestic terrorism in the United States, of course, was the bombing of uh, uh, the Mura Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Again, conventional weapon modeled after that in the uh, uh, Turner uh, Diaries and designed in McVeigh's words to get to maximal body count. So this is those two curves, uh, and note the opposite uh, directions. And one of the questions then is uh, how, and again, PSYOPs is really important here, and I'll be uh, talking about how information is crucial in dealing with terrorism. But let me uh, take you uh, now into the spectrum of, of terrorisms, plural. And it's really important to understand this. Um, uh, some of the terrorisms differ quite different, uh, radically from others. Across the top, we have political terrorism, uh, criminal terrorism, pathological terrorism. Uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat more uh, uh, alliteratively, uh, we could uh, speak of uh, uh, crazies, criminals, and crusaders. Uh, the criminal terrorism has fused in some areas uh, with uh, political terrorism. So particularly in the Andean nations, the social revolutionary terrorists, uh, which is down to the lower left, 
have become mercenaries for the narco-traficantes, but even, um, more than that, they're almost collaborators in many ways, and they're getting uh, their, their social revolutionary goals have somewhat weakened as they become enriched by uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their working with uh, the narcotics traffickers. Pathological terrorism, uh, the crazies, uh, in effect, uh, and uh, here's something you may not fully understand, but it's, it's quite uh, demonstrable. Terrorists are not crazy. Terrorists are not crazed fanatics. To be psychologically unstable is a security risk, and terrorist groups expel individuals from them that are security risks. So we are talking about psychologically normal individuals. Um, when I say normal, I'll qualify that in uh, just a moment. Now, so we're going to be focusing on political terrorism. At the middle tier, we have uh, th uh, three different groups represented. Uh, the regime or state terrorism. This refers to the circumstance when the state uses its own uh, resources, its own powerful resources, against its own citizens. Uh, so Argentina during the Dirty Wars uh, is one example. Germany during the 1930s, when the security forces, the judiciary are allied. You, you recall in Argentina, we had the so-called disappearances, where any critic of the government ended up being, quotes, disappeared. A new verb uh, uh, entered uh, our, our, our lexicon. Um, State-supported terrorism, of course, has been of great concern to our nation, indeed preoccupying. And this is when a state uh, using plausible deniability, provides support to terrorist groups to accomplish its goals uh, internationally. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lib uh, Libya, uh, uh, at times uh, Sudan, uh, it may be Pakistan will be uh, uh, entering uh, that list as well as Afghanistan. Uh, for political reasons, Cuba has been on that list as well as uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, but these are groups uh, supporting terrorist groups. And one of the interesting questions is, how can one weaken the ties between the supporting nation and the, uh, um, uh, and the group? But we'll be focusing, in terms of psychological understandings, on sub-state terrorism, terrorism from below, so-called. Um, and I will uh, try to say something about each of these groups. Let me dispense first at the far right with single-issue terrorism. And note that definition I gave you was substance-free, so to speak. Uh, uh, it had nothing to do with the cause. A number of the causes we'll be talking about are causes which many of us might well support. It is the process, uh, it is the, uh, the means uh, that we decry. However wonderful a cause, uh, however much we might believe there should be a separate Palestinian state, however much we might be, say, in this country, uh, pro-life, we can... Uh, a, a be a find abhorrent the taking of innocent life to accomplish that goal. I, I might note I have always found it rather perplexing uh, that uh, a, a group professing uh, uh, reverence for the sanctity of life could take life in, in order to save life, and it's an interesting paradox. A friend of mine um, has a uh, daughter who was. Uh, married a few years ago to a young man in New York whose father was a uh, uh, Alaska award-winning biologist. Uh, uh, he had, using animal subjects, uh, he had uh, made a breakthrough in the treatment of diabetes which promised to save tens of thousands of lives. The animal rights terrorists targeted him for his abuse of uh, animal uh, subjects, and I might note as the uh, fond owner of two uh, wire-haired dachshunds, uh, I would be appalled by uh, uh, cruel treatment of animals uh, uh, as well. They, he, had a, uh, he lived in New York and had a place out in the Hamptons where he went to on weekends. They firebombed his house on the Hamptons while he was in it, and he barely escaped with his life. The cause is not the cause. It is impossible, I mean, well, Human beings are a uh, higher species. They are an animal species. And there's something really bizarre, I would suggest, about being willing to take uh, human life uh, in order to uh, defend uh, uh, animal uh, life. Uh, and that theme, the cause is not the cause, is one I will echo again uh, throughout this presentation. So we're going to be talking mainly about 
social revolutionary terrorism of the left, sometimes called anarchic terrorism, right-wing terrorism, nationalist separatist terrorism, such as we're seeing uh, being played out in, uh, 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 in, uh, by Palestinian radicals, uh, even as we speak, um, and in Northern Ireland with the real IRA, religious extremist terrorism. I used to just have religious fundamentalist terrorism, but since the uh, um, ascension of uh, Aum Shinrikyo, um, uh, which represents a new terrorist group, uh, a, a millenarian terrorist group, I've added this, uh, uh, this cell as well. Uh, this is a matrix I've developed to help differentiate some of these uh, groups. Uh, down the left, we have the youth's relationship to the parents, where L stands for loyalty, D for disloyalty. Across the top, the parents' relationship to the regime. Again, L for loyalty, D for disloyalty, damage, dissent. What the upper left-hand cell with the X in it says is that individuals who are loyal to families who are at one with the regime don't become terrorists. This means for two of the major groups, we have totally opposite uh, circumstances. Uh, the nationalist separatist terrorists uh, represent individuals who are loyal to families that have been damaged by the regime. They are carrying on the missions of their fathers and grandfathers. Um, I had the interesting opportunity four years ago now of working uh, as a terrorist expert at the Department of Justice in the trial of a uh, Abu Naidal, terrorist who was responsible for the skyjacking of uh, uh, an Egypt airplane over Malta in which uh, uh, some 50 people lost their uh, lives in the botched SWAT team attack at the end of this. This young man, and I had the opportunity of uh, uh, spending some 16 hours interviewing him, um, was uh, in, nine years old during the 67 war when uh, and he lived on his grandfather's farm uh, in uh, the West Bank, and they were forced out of their homes and went to a uh, 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 refugee camp in Jordan. Um, he heard at this time from his mother, he had heard to this somewhat before, but now it had greater emphasis, that in 1948, the family had lived in Haifa, in, uh, in mainland uh, uh, Israel, now, uh, and had been forced out in the 1948 war, and that's when they went to a grandfather's room. When he went into uh, uh, this um, school uh, uh, that was uh, in the refugee camps, funded by the United Nations, taught by PLO members, he learned from age nine on that the only career for a uh, young man in, uh, 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 in Palestine was to become a soldier of the revolution and regain the lands taken from his parents and grandparents. Starting at age nine, there was basic schooling in the morning, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, and in the afternoon, paramilitary training. Obstacle courses, learning uh, small weapons, uh, how to handle them. Uh, uh, as a teenager, moved into learning how to make explosives. And, uh, and he was regularly being inspired to uh, fight uh, uh, for, his, for his people. He went from uh, uh, group to group, started off with mainland Fatah when uh, Arafat was uh, uh, forced out uh, of, uh, of uh, Tunisia, or forced out to uh, Tunisia, forced out of Lebanon. Uh, he, w he felt this was a disgrace, went to an ever more violent group, but ended up in the most violent group of them all, the Abu Nadal group. When he went for, to lead this mission, uh, to hijack this plane, this was uh, not some sort of a depraved act. He was a soldier for the revolution. It was the proudest moment of his life. He was fulfilling the destiny he had been socialized uh, uh, to. And, it was re and what was quite compelling, and I must say rather chilling, um, as he described to me in this matter-of-fact way, kind of like a military debrief when I was talking um, um, to him. They were at an impasse. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, had been instructed, he told me, uh, that the way to uh, get the refueling 
was to start killing hostages and that the first people to kill were Israelis. Went through the uh, passports, found two Israeli passports, uh, two women, uh, and uh, they had said to him, and we had the control tower tapes, it was really quite interesting, to read, calm, cool, totally collected, really in command. Uh, he said, we are going to uh, kill the hostages unless you refuel us. We will not refuel you, they said, uh, unless you release the hostages. He said, so what could I do? I had to persuade them. I called, I had them bring forward uh, the first Palestinian, the first Israeli woman, grabbed her hair with my left hand, took my revolver, put it to her temple and said, I'm going to kill an Israeli passenger, a woman, uh, unless you release uh, uh, this plane and refuel us. Uh, we will not refuel you until you release the passengers. So what could I do? I blew her brains out. By then I was getting rather hungry. Uh, so I asked the uh, steward uh, to uh, uh, get me a sandwich, and he got me a very nice club sandwich. It was totally bizarre. I mean, it was, you know, so I killed her. What else could I do? And, and then I was hungry and got a sandwich. Same tone of voice. Could have been talking about taking out the trash when he killed this woman. Uh, and I said to him, how did you feel about killing a woman? He said, oh, well, it was explained to me that in Israel, both men and women joined the military, so they are both their enemies, so they both de they deserve to die. And I see. But, you know, it was, kind of, it was, it was quite, quite, quite remarkable. And it, it, he was so totally matter-of-fact about blowing, the, and then he described uh, doing the same thing with the next woman, grabbing her hair in his left hand, taking his revolver, putting it to her temple, blowing her brains out. By now, they surely should have been persuaded, but they weren't. So I had to start killing Americans. Uh, it was uh, uh, an amazing uh, uh, experience because he was not talking about an any kind of empathic connection with his victims. It was the enemy they deserved to die, and he, and he had been instructed to do this, and he was a soldier in combat. I'm now involved in a project, uh, I'm just writing up the final report on this, we've interviewed 32 incarcerated Palestinian terrorists, first time it's ever been done, a systematic uh, structured interview. And what is really very uh, troubling uh, in many ways is just how normal these people are. They've been socialized within a group that violence is the answer and to not join a group now in particular is to be strange. It's the social thing to do. It's almost the, it's the path of honor uh, for many. And uh, this is both the religious uh, terrorists as well as the nationalist separatist terrorists. In Northern Ireland, we also have uh, uh, nationalist separatist terrorism. And whether it's, and, and again, just to think of this, it's, it's carrying on their parents' cause. So in some ways, it's a proud thing to do, and there's a badge of honor. And in fact, one of the things we've had the opportunity to uh, talk with family members who said, well, on the one hand, we regret losing our son. We are so proud. And he arranged for us to have financial security now uh, because Hamas and other groups uh, have been providing monies to the families of these individuals. So Northern Ireland um, uh, uh, is one example of uh, national separatist terrorism. Uh, another is... Uh, the uh, uh, Palestinian radicals, ETA, the Basque Fatherland and Homeland uh, Movement uh, in uh, the Basque region of, uh, of, of Spain, uh, Asala, the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia. These are all nationalist separatist groups. Uh, moving to our lower left, we have the flip side of this, social revolutionary terrorism. This was a terrorism which was particularly prominent uh, during the uh, days of rage in the uh, early 70s, uh, when we had uh, the uh, uh, radical terrorists in uh, Germany, uh, uh, the uh, Bader Meinhof gang and the Red Army faction in Italy, uh, the Red Brigades. Uh, in the United States, we had our own brand of uh, social revolutionary uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, when uh, the Weather Underground split off from Students for a Democratic uh, uh, Society. Uh, here, it is uh, youth breaking away from the generation of their parents which is loyal to the regime. Uh, one of the German terrorists uh, said uh, something to the, uh, uh, along the lines of, uh, this is the generation of corrupt old men who gave us Auschwitz and Hiroshima. There's an interesting book about the German terrorists called uh, Hitler's Children, 
that the uh, uh, the uh, the children of the of Hitler Youth have gone on to become terrorists, revolting against the uh, fascist violence of their parents by their belief in Marxist uh, Leninism. Now, this has significantly declined with the fall of the Soviet Union, but there still are uh, social revolutionary groups present. The Japanese Red Army uh, uh, continues. Uh, in Latin America, we have in Colombia, uh, ELN, M15, uh, the FARC, uh, all social revolutionary groups. Uh, Sendero Luminoso, which has de been decapitated with the death of its charismatic, or with the capture of its charismatic leader Guzman, uh, nevertheless continues, and that's a Maoist group, of, uh, uh, of course. Uh, so we, uh, we see still a, a tendency to have this. And I might note, as I've looked at the rhetoric, to jump ahead uh, somewhat, uh, of the uh, information age terrorists, some of their rhetoric uh, strongly resembles that of the uh, social revolutionary terrorists of, of, of yesteryear. We have the digital libertarians who say all information should be free uh, and are attacking using uh, uh, specialized computer techniques with denial of service attacks and others and, and uh, getting into computers uh, to make sure all information is free and it's a, re a revolt against the, uh, the authoritarian system that is trying to uh, block uh, uh, this noble goal. Um. Oops. So, nationalist separatists are carrying on the mission of their parents. Their acts of terrorism are acts of retaliation for hurt done to their parents and grandparents by society. They are loyal to parents damaged by the regime. The social revolutionary terrorists, their goal is to destroy the world of their fathers. Their acts of terrorism are acts of retaliation for real and imagined hurts against the society of their parents, symbolically dissenting against parents loyal to the regime. Now let's move to what has been increasing, as I noted earlier, uh, holy terror, killing in the name of God. What an interesting paradox um, that uh, clerical figures could be promoting violence. I want to emphasize, while well, we tend to think of uh, uh, religious fundamentalist terrorism as uh, a strictly an Islamic phenomenon, all of the great religions um, have uh, fundamentalist terrorists uh, within them. I also want to make sure that it's clear when I speak about fundamentalism, uh, we ought not equate fundamentalism with terrorism. The large majority of uh, religious fundamentalists uh, are not at all prone to violence. Uh, there is what is called the quietest sentiment, who believes literally in scripture, is waiting for the arrival of the uh, Messiah, and is trying to lead a good life, be it in Islam, uh, in Judaism, or in Christianity. Within each of the fundamentalist strands is a small group of what are called religious belligerents, who believe it is important to force the end, that unless they act with religious conviction, uh, the Messiah's arrival on earth will be delayed. Um, let me uh, speak uh, briefly uh, uh, about uh, uh, an Israeli uh, uh, radical group, Gush Emunim. There was a small radical group within it uh, which planned the bombing of the uh, Temple Mount. Uh, this was not uh, and I emphasize not, an anti-Arab act. Uh, sitting astride the Temple Mount uh, were two of the holiest sites in Islam, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. Uh, they sat astride the site of the Third Temple, uh, one of the holiest sites uh, 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 in Israel. Uh, and uh, the goal of this act, planned act, which the rabbi did not sanctify, I might note, uh, so it did not get carried out, was to clear the way for the construction, the reconstruction of the, of the, uh, of the third temple. Um, I had the interesting opportunity of uh, spending a day after he was released from prison with one of the uh, Israeli uh, 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 terrorists uh, who had been involved, who was an activist. He was a high school principal, and he, and he first trashed the, uh, uh, the site of a... Um, 
a, a, a Christian missionary in Jerusalem. Um, I took his history. I, I think it's terribly important to understand people in the context of their lives. He was American and boasted to me about getting 800 on his math SATs, uh, went to uh, MIT, where he majored in mathematical logic. And I could just see, as he went on to talk about logic, how what an appealing figure he must have been for his high school students. Because he, uh, he said to me, you know, doctor, uh, logic uh, is just so compelling, so beautiful in its elegance and its precision. You have a premise, you set the syllogistic logical engine to work, and you come out with a conclusion. And of course, to have a conclusion which is not related to action is meaningless, right? I said, well, of course. Uh, so uh, I said, so explain to me, what, what, uh, what, uh, how did you justify trashing the, uh, first time I was arrested, trashing the, uh, uh, the side of this Christian missionary? I said, well, what's the basic premise? Israel is a Jewish state. Is it logical? to have a Jewish state with a Christian missionary giving out proselytizing material? Totally illogical. What other, site, what other possibility do we have for action? And in terms of what he had just been jailed for, his role in the Temple Mount uh, plot, think about this. Here we have basic premise, the Jewish state, holy shrines of Islam sitting astride one of the holiest places in all of Judaism. Does it make any sense? Totally illogical. What, what opportunity uh, do we have to do anything else? We were compelled by our logic to do this. And the interesting thing about this guy, this guy was totally normal and quite congenial. Served me milk and cookies, uh, or tea and cookies, uh, in, in his home. And I'm sure any of you would have found him a fascinating dinner partner. Uh, 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 totally cosmopolitan uh, individual, quite sophisticated, until you hit the rock-hard area of his, uh, of his belief system. And that was simply uh, impenetrable. I would remind you that uh, the assassin of uh, uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who in many ways was the assassin of peace uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, to his pleasure, uh, was a young radical Jewish theological student who had been persuaded by the radical rabbis that uh, the judgment of the pursued, of the pursuer, had been affixed to uh, Rabin, which comes from the book of Leviticus, says that it is, that the, the, the biblical commandment by the way is not thou shalt not kill, it's thou shalt not murder, and killing is sanctified, indeed, it becomes a moral sacrament to carry out if it's in the service of God's commands in all of the great religions. Um, and uh, in Leviticus said, thou must not, uh, thou must not permit uh, 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 thy brother's blood. Uh, and what this says is, it is, it is, it is important, if, if the innocent is being pursued by a killer, to kill the killer. And by putting a den of terrorists through the Oslo Accords on the, uh, on the very uh, uh, borders of, uh, of Israel, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, was in effect a, a, a potential uh, threat to the innocents within Israel. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, group of, uh, of, of individuals. Uh, I've identified here uh, fundamental differences uh, of religious uh, uh, fundamentalist terrorism. Other terrorisms are interested in influencing contemporary society. Fundamentalist religious terrorism wishes no dialogue with contemporary society, wants to return to its roots, and wishes to eliminate modernizing influences, at the top of which is the United States, at the top of which is the President of the United States. And during the um, uh, uh, hostage crisis in Iran, uh, in fact, posters came out of uh, uh, Iran uh, uh, showing a lightning bolt striking the White House shattering it into a hundred pieces and, uh, and, and shattering the head of, 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 of Jimmy Carter on, on top of the White House, indicating that the Shah was no longer the enemy. Um, now the enemy was the great Satan in the United States. And quite importantly for other terrorists, there's often ambivalence about violence. These are true believers and if their ayatollah or minister or rabbi has said this is a religiously sanctified act. There's no ambivalence about this because the authority on religious belief 
has communicated to them that this, uh, this is uh, an act which will bring you a higher place uh, 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 in paradise. The rhetoric of uh, a group I haven't touched on, um, those who would uh, kill uh, uh, physicians or nurses uh, conducting abortions, again, killing, taking life to preserve life, that strange paradox, their rhetoric is quite interesting. Um, an excommunicated bishop, Bishop Troche, uh, quite charismatic, said, if you were walking down, uh, this was on public television uh, on uh, the Ted Koppel show, uh, if you were walking down uh, the streets of Auschwitz-Birkenau during the Holocaust, and you came across the uh, Dr. Death, Dr. Mengele, uh, who chose who would live and who would die, and was orchestrating some of the terrible experiments on the victims of the Holocaust, would you be a murderer? No, you would be a hero. You were killing a perpetrator of the Holocaust and helping to delay the carrying out of this, uh, of this terrible, terrible uh, plan to destroy this life. A Holocaust is being visited upon the uh, um, unborn in this uh, country. Uh, anyone who kills a nurse or a doctor taking part in that Holocaust is not a murderer, they are a hero. Has a kind of interesting logic uh, uh, to that that is particularly uh, uh, seductive to some, some extremists. Um, this is the, uh, one of the posters that came out of Iran showing that uh, shift uh, from the Shah as being the main opponent uh, of uh, 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 Khomeini uh, to the United States as being the main target. And the ability to inflame public opinion against the United States is one, is one which uh, unifies a number of these, uh, uh, of these groups. And, uh, uh, and it, is, it is, look at this, I mean, here's, this is a propaganda poster, isn't it? Uh, uh, you don't counter that by bombing uh, uh, countries. How do we counter that to provide a, a, a countering uh, uh, influence? An interesting character, uh, Shoko Asahara of Aum uh, uh, Shinrikyo, uh, high-tech guy, became fascinated by the role of uh, technology uh, and recruited biochemists, nuclear physicists, uh, microbiologists uh, at the PhD level, was carrying out experiments in all three weapons of mass destruction uh, at the same uh, time, chemical, biological, uh, nuclear. Um, had a high-tech way of dealing with defectors his uh, organization was something like the Roach Hotel, easy to get in but hard to get out. Uh, and uh, when a couple of people tried to uh, defect, he had a uh, high-tech way of uh, getting rid of them and, and, uh, and influencing the other people to stay within. He had a microwave, uh, an industry-sized microwave oven in which he incinerated uh, uh, the uh, victims. This concentrated the attention of potential defectors. Um, but he wanted to precipitate uh, the millennium. Now, there's an interesting uh, aspect, and we've done an analysis of I mean, this. Here was a group that had a huge number of indicators of the pathway they were on, and no one noticed them. And we've done a, a systematic uh, study uh, uh, of indicators of uh, terrorism in general and of weapons of mass destruction in particular. How do we know? But uh, recruiting PhD biochemists, nuclear physicists, microbiologists, pretty damn clear um, uh, indicator. Uh, also, in, in, in this religious cult's leader's own writings, he shifted from being just uh, 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 using Buddhist theology, but wrote a book, well, When I Became the Christ. And what was clear is he had identified himself with, with Christ, and one of the things missing earlier was a sense of urgency. And in Christianity, with the book of Revelations, there was a sense of millenarian urgency. So he fused the sense of urgency uh, in Christianity. Uh, and he was going to precipitate the millennial struggle and then be resurrected uh, along with his, uh, his followers. Um, quite a fascinating character. Uh, again, a high-tech thing. Uh, he had uh, actually, he rented for only $10,000 a month. Uh, you could get a headset designed to coordinate your brain waves with his brain waves, uh, and also managed to uh, uh, sell samples of his bath water. Uh, this was only for a thousand hours. You could have his bodily essence within you, which is very 
stimulating to his followers. Um, right wing, on the increase in this country, uh, we have uh, 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 we have found the enemy and they is us. Uh, it's very interesting, since the end of the uh, Cold War with the loss of the communist enemy, which was a great, a great appeal to uh, the uh, uh, to the right wing. Uh, uh, we we had uh, uh, a number of extremely uh, strange groups out there talking about the Red Menace and communists have already invaded this country, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do when the enemy is gone? It's very threatening. How do you hold your group together? Well, now, and it's kind of, kind of disconcerting to me, living in Washington. Uh, the enemy uh, is the U.S. government, called ZOG, uh, the Zionist-occupied uh, government. It's delegitimized uh, by these uh, groups. Uh, and uh, the Bible of uh, these groups uh, is uh, uh, a uh, book, The Turner Diaries, written by a former nuclear physicist, uh, Pierce, uh, who uh, went on to... Uh, uh, because after, le after leaving his academic role to become deputy uh, uh, director of the American Nazi Party and now heads the National Alliance. I made the mistake in ordering uh, the book, of ordering it from their website, uh, and I can't get off of their mailing list now. And each, uh, <laughs> each, uh, each month I get this new list of why Hitler was the greatest man that ever lived on the racial inferiority of blacks, uh, why the Jews are the spawn of the devil. It's quite charming. Um, there is a religious uh, pseudo-Christian theology which uh, we consider extremely dangerous. And I might note there are a number of military bases, uh, small cells of right-wing uh, individuals who have access to weapons, and this is of great concern uh, to, uh, to the U.S. Uh, um, military. Um, the, there is a unifying theology uh, which uh, brings together the disparate strands of racism, anti-Semitism, and survivalism. Survivalism being those who, uh, like the Posse Comitatus and leaderless resistance, who say there's no legitimate authority for that of the, of the, uh, uh, the county uh, sheriff. And it's called uh, Christian, Christian Identity Movement. Are any of you familiar with that? Uh, really quite scary. Um, it it uh, was a descendant of Anglo-Israelism, uh, which was a movement started in Europe, in, in Great Britain, which said that the Jews were not the chosen people. The true chosen people were the Northern Europeans, in particular the Aryans. When it left the Atlantic, it changed, because by now the Jew, uh, uh, in, there was a theological change. And this is the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ Christian. Why is it called the Church of Jesus Christ Christian? Because for this totally anti-Semitic group, the notion Christ could have been a Jew is, is total antipathy. I mean, this, this is in, uh, uh, inconceivable. Uh, and the, that church is the theological arm of the Aryan nations, just to put that in, in context, which was brought down, I might note, by the leadership of Morris Dees uh, here in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, of the Christian P uh, Poverty Law Center. The theology goes like this. In the Garden of Eden, Eve mated with two. Uh, she mated with Adam, who was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, from which came the Adamic race, of which Christ is a, is a descendant. Uh, and and the, first, uh, the first offspring from that was Abel. She also mated with the uh, devil, uh, which was this, the serpent, was the devil in disguise. From this came the spawn of the devil, human-looking uh, the Jews, but they're actually the spawn of the devil. And the first offspring of this was Cain. So, when Cain slew Abel, uh, that was the prototype of the genocide of the white race, which the spawn of the devil, the Jews, are planning. However, the Jews can't do it alone. And what you all may not know, uh, according to this theology, is that uh, uh, there was a previous attempt at creation before the Garden of Eden, uh, but it failed. God screwed up. Uh, and uh, from this came uh, subhumans, the mud people, blacks, and people of color. So the Jews, the spawn of the devil, in league with blacks and people of color, uh, the mud people, uh, are planning the annihilation of the white race. Accordingly, uh, in these extremist groups, when they're going out for uh, uh, some of the more extreme groups, like the, uh, the militia of Montana, when they're going out practicing, uh, this, these are not mere weekend warriors. They are 
planning to defend themselves and learning the military defense uh, tactics uh, against the coming, uh, the coming struggle of the forces of light, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Aryans, uh, against the uh, uh, forces of darkness, the spawn of the devil, the Jews and blacks uh, uh, working together. Quite scary uh, kind of stuff. Now let me uh, uh, bring to a uh, conclusion uh, by walking you through uh, this, um, uh, this chart, because what I've tried to do here is differentiate the different types of terrorism uh, against the likelihood or unlikelihood uh, and constraints against moving into mass casualty terrorism. Um, first, we have social revolutionary terrorists. And uh, I might note the asterisk, and this is probably hard, I'll, I'll go through this uh, visually for you. The asterisk says, um, these are discriminate acts which do not endanger constituents, usually outside the regional-based territory. So social revolutionary terrorists have been involved in mass ca conventional mass casualty terrorism. Um, I've got across the top not only conventional mass casualty terrorism, but WMD hoax. This is something we've insufficiently attended to. You can do an awful lot of damage with a hoax, a sham attack, without any of the constraints. Think of the uh, a sham anthrax attack in Washington a, a couple of years ago, paralyzed the city, called attention to the cause. It was a successful uh, a, a, a biological terrorist attack, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, no one died, but it got the message across. Don't forget, the goal is to communicate to that other audience, right? Uh, Small-scale WMD use, mass casualty use, and then what some call super-terrorism, catastrophic WMD use. Uh, I, uh, just to note, I'm a little bit counterculture uh, in this uh, area, and we'd like to persuade you of some of this reading. If you, if you buy what I've been talking about, about the goals of these different groups, for what groups is it uh, a positive incentive to have tens of thousands of deaths? That question is simply not being addressed. It's simply not being addressed. Uh, we are vulnerable, our leaders say, on the one hand, and there is a capability. Well, the capability is much less able. Uh, uh, yes, one can make, uh, uh, one, one can cook up batches of, uh, of, of, of anthrax and produce uh, 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 nerve gas. But the weaponization of that to construct a large, it, it, it takes a considerable exper uh, expertise and has considerable danger attached to it. So I think we're preparing for something that's highly unlikely uh, and uh, ought to be focusing much more of our intelligence resources on the small number of groups for whom there's less of a disincentive. And note, one of the major threateners, Osama bin Laden, in fact, his, his greatest successes have been with conventional weapons, not with the WMD. Uh, so swiftly, social revolutionary terrorists, um, no likelihood of catastrophic terrorism, could do mass casualty terrorism, but only against a non, uh, a, a non constituents They want to influence their people. Ditto for nationalist separatists. You can imagine uh, much more easily a, a, a mass attack in uh, mass casualty attack in Tel Aviv than in Jerusalem, for example. They are attacking Jerusalem, but quite. Uh, 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 quite narrowly with small weapons. The right wing is a source of some danger and have much, uh, the right wing uh, characteristically has been much less concerned with uh, who the, uh, 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 how much damage is wrought. However, uh, they tend to, uh, to not have the technical, technological expertise or resource uh, available. And most of the uh, uh, events of uh, use of, uh, of CBRN weapons, by, and there have been some, by the right wing have been an individual or a small group, not the large organization necessary to use uh, large, large scale weapons. I note here something I consider of danger, the right wing community of belief. Very scary in the age of the internet, you can have groups of people connected only through the internet. And I believe there's an incentive uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, to do this, uh, 
to move into action when you feel not alone and are stimulated through the extremity of the internet. Tune in, by the way, to uh, uh, Stormfront, a right-wing uh, website. You'll see some very scary uh, stuff there. So finally, the two areas of greatest concern are religious fundamentalists and new religions. Most of the new religious groups are passive. The only one we've ever known, which was uh, at the extremity of Aum Shinrikyo, is Aum Shinrikyo. Uh, these two groups need to be watched very closely and are a source of danger. But I think we have overreacted to the extremity of danger uh, from weapons of mass destruction terrorism. And, that, uh, and in so doing, are not protecting our embassies with money which is fungible uh, against the weapon of choice, conventional bombs, which will be and uh, remain uh, as the major, the major weapon for some kind come. Well, I thank you for your attention, and I, I wish you well. <laughs>